Kia ora whana. My name is Joshua Fouts. I am uh, executive director of a sister organization to New Frontiers called Bioneers. It's a 30-year-old nonprofit known for an annual conference hosted outside of San Francisco every October, highlighting practical solutions around social and environmental justice. And there are so many members of our family here, and the interconnections between these two organizations make me feel like I've landed in, in um, an extended family. And I really want to thank Matthew and Brian and Yosef and Nisi and, uh, and, and the ancestral Maori uh, who have given permission for us to host and be part of this gathering on their land. Um, thank you all for making this possible. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, of a diversion. We've heard a couple, uh, so many powerful stories about uh, interspecies communication. Um, Severin just spoke about uh, hu human and plant communication, and I'm going to talk about uh, human and non-human communication. Uh, so I've talk, told you a little bit about pioneers, and this is, uh, this is my 12th birthday, or this, this is a picture from my 12th birthday. Uh, a little bit of background, my parents uh, were part of a research project in the 1960s that through the, dare I say, hubris of humanity, wanted to differentiate what it was that made humans special. And much of the, uh, the, the contemporary research at that time was that what made humans special from the rest of the planet and the rest of li living species was that we had the capacity for language. And my dad likes to say that humans are always trying to divide these differences in degrees rather than listening to the, uh, to the words and wisdom of first peoples who have always understood that humans are integrated into our all species, all beings on the, in our planet. Anyway, uh, chimpanzees were uh, and are our closest living relatives. We are more chimp than we are human. I am more chimp than I am uh, anything else, and chimps are more us than they are gorilla or orangutan or any of the great apes and primates. They have a high capacity for nonverbal communication, but they don't have a capacity for voluntary verbal communication. So the way that chimps uh, vocalizations occur is through their limbic system, and a limbic system is totally involuntary. So an example would be if I had a glass of water and I dropped it on your foot, you wouldn't look down and say, hmm, that hurts, you'd say, ow! And that's how chimps vocalize. It's highly adaptive for the wild. If you're in one side of the jungle and you see food, and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is the food bark, oh, 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 oh. then the other chimps on the other side of the, of the forest will know and gather, and they'll have food. But they, we also noted, scientists also knows that, noted that chimps had a high degree of nonverbal communication. They would raise their arm if they wanted to be um, groomed or, or, or met. Other chimps in other parts of of uh, the African continent would use different signals to, si to signal that. And so the pr my parents' project was based on the premise that they should take a culture, take a species on its own terms. If the species can't actually speak uh, v uh, verbally, but they do have a capacity for nonverbal communication, why not treat them as though they were a human? How is it that humans learn their language? We're born into families that we love, and we want to communicate with our parents. And whatever language those parents might be speaking, whether it be sign language, or Farsi, or English, or Maori, we learn that language. Um, so they adopted a, uh, or rescued, I guess I should say this in, in the genre, of, in the language of today, a, uh, an infant chimp who was part of the United States Air Force space program. She would have otherwise been sent up into a rocket, but instead she was adopted into a family in Reno, Nevada. And they immersed her in sign language and surrounded her by people that she loved. In fact, my dad, who was not an original member of the project, was specifically hired by Washoe. Washoe was the name of, the, of this first chimp. And the way the hiring process was is that my dad was applying for a PhD, and he needed an assistantship to pay for his, his graduate research. And, and um, he actually went to meet with, this, with the professor who was leading the project, and the professor, and he came in as a, as a young 21-year-old and said, I, I'm, I'm passionate about psychiatry and clinical research. And the professor looked at him and said, well, I, I, I hate psychiatry, I hate clinical research, but since you've driven all the way here, I'll at least invite you to see our project. And so my dad, crestfallen and, and dejected, thinking he's going to have to go back and be a teller in a bank, walks over to, uh, with, the, with um, Alan Gardner, who's his professor, to this um, small playground, and there's a little fence, and there was a little black creature in the playground. And she saw the two gentlemen walking toward her, leaps over the fence, 
runs to the two gentlemen and jumps not into the arms of what would have been her father, but into my dad's arms. And the man looked over at my dad and said, well, you're hired. <laughs> and that essentially set the trajectory. So fast forward, what I want to do now is tell you, so we had a, I had an interesting experience this last week where one of my colleagues at Bioneers said that she was going to be giving a speech about me. And I said, uh, thank you, and what, what might this topic be about? She said, it's about how you have decolonized the patriarchy of organizations. And I said, um, I said well, thank you for that as well. Uh, how might you, and she, she's a First People, she's the co-director of the Bioneers Indigeneity program. And she said, no. You have allowed me, as a first person, as a first member of the of First Peoples, and as a woman, to feel completely empowered and not under the thumb of a patriarchal leader. And I said, wow, thank you. And, I, and then I began to ask myself, why is it that, I, what is it about me, what is it about what formed me in my upbringing that might have influenced or, or shaped that? And I started to look back at the decades that I was uh, immersed in my parents' project, and one of the so one of the things that happens, so I'm going to accelerate the time, uh, given the, the nine minutes they have to go. Um, so fast forward, my parents end up, uh, the project grows, there are now five chimpanzees, uh, President Reagan is elected, Reagan decides that all federal funding for behavioral research needs to be cut, uh, my parents end up having to create a nonprofit in order to feed the chimps, so our family goes from a family of five humans to a family of ten uh, primates. My parents refer to us as the, the they, they said that the chimps are actually my aunts and uncles because my dad views them as their siblings. He viewed his relationship with Washoe, who hired him, as his big sister. And that was the uh, sort of hierarchy of our, of our family. And so we were never to refer to the chimps as chimps, but as non-human primates, because guess what? We're all primates. Um, so, uh, but, but because they had to create a nonprofit, we were enlisted to uh, dumpster dive at the back of grocery stores. Uh, it turns out that while humans uh, are very particular about the color of bananas or fruit that they eat, chimps are, will very happily eat a brown banana or, or, or a, an apple that, has, uh, that, that might not be in, in its, perfect, uh, its most perfect um, uh, uh, ripeness. And, uh, and so what we, so the, the first story I want to share with you, I'm going to share with you three stories. This is me with my aunt Tatu. Interestingly enough, I was thinking how the Tatu is actually um, uh, a, uh, um, uh, uh, I lost my, my uh, it, what's the, 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 the word? For, uh, anyway, it's, a, it's an East African language, for, uh, forget the aphasia. Anyway, so this is my aunt Tatu, and uh, I'm going to tell a story about three stories. One is about uh, the, the lesson of humility. So the chimp I'm going to tell you about is not in this picture. This is a chimp named Bowie. So fast forward, we're now living in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, my dad is now teaching uh, graduate students about, about ch how to teach chimps sign language, how to immerse them, how to take chimps on their own terms. But he's the big alpha, uh, alpha uh, professor. And so we, he would take students out and they would interact with the chimps. And the chimps, unfortunately, that time had to wear a lead, somewhat of a leash around their neck. It wouldn't have stopped the chimp from doing anything because a chimp is eight times the strength of a human kilogram for kilogram. So a 40 pound chimp is uh, basically equivalent to, a, uh, or 40 kilogram chimp is equivalent to a 240 kilogram human in top physical condition. Um, <laughs> so uh, my dad says, okay, the class is over. And the, the chimp he was with was named Bowie. And he said, okay, Bowie, it's time to go back. And Bowie uh, didn't want to go back. He was having such a good time. So he climbs up in a tree. Uh, well, my dad, being the, uh, the young alpha male professor, wasn't going to let that chimp show him up. So he wraps his arm around the lead, and he says, Bowie, come down now. And Bowie reaches down from the branch he's sitting on the tree with one arm and lifts the lead up. So my dad is now swinging. <laughs> the end. But in a moment of, uh, of humility, my dad says, Bowie, I'm sorry, I forgive you. Bowie, so thrilled at this moment of compassion, leaps down out of the tree into my dad's arms, and they went away. The lesson I took away from that is one of the importance of humility. A few years later, Washoe, the lead matriarch, becomes pregnant. Um, in her pregnancy, the chimps, unfortunately, at that time, were living in cages uh, because, uh, and I can, I'll tell you, after the talk, I can explain those details, but it's, it was not our desire to have the chimps live in, ch live in cages. And in fact, my parents, at this point, more or less discerned this was a project that should never have been done because it, because it condemned 
a sapient creature to a life of imprisonment because of the hubris of us wanting to understand what it was that differentiated us from them. So unfortunately, Wash's newborn baby gets, uh, gets sick because of a rust uh, in the cage, catches pneumonia. Washo takes a toothbrush and tries to uh, clean out her child's throat. At this point, the throat's been lacerated, and the humans have to, to intervene and take the baby away. The baby ultimately dies. Washo goes into what would be considered a clinical depression. She refuses to interact with people. Every time my dad would come see her, she would say, baby, baby, with the eyes raised. And my dad would say, no, the baby's finished. The baby's finished. Um, uh, so as he, uh, and, and finally, they, uh, they, they found an adoptive uh, son for, for Washo, who was actually featured in the previous first slide that I showed you on my, on my 12th birthday. Um, but what, uh, what this story of Washo's depression uh, taught me was one of compassion and empathy, and the importance that we, as humans, distinguish our own emotions from the emotions of non-humans without realizing that all creatures experience the same level of grief and emotion that we do. Okay, so my third and final story takes us to the present day. So the project goes on for some 40 years, and then my parents uh, retire. Three of the chimps ultimately die from undiagnosed viruses in their, in their 40s. Part of the problem there is that while the chimps had a high capacity uh, for, for sign language and could express a lot of things, they tend, didn't, couldn't explain the nuances of what it meant to feel pain and to hurt. Um, and so my parents decided that the chimps had spent enough time uh, being observed by humans and deserved a retirement. So the two final chimps were retired to a chimp sanctuary outside of Montreal in Quebec. Um, so my life went on, and I got married and had kids and moved across the United States, and a decade goes by, and I hadn't seen the chimps. And so last October, my wife and I decided to go up to, to Montreal and, and visit the two remaining chimps. Uh, Mary Lee Jenswold, who is the new executive director of my parents' projects, warned me. She said, you know, um, Tatu, who is featured in this picture, gets very angry when people, uh, when people see her, people who come to visit her, who she's known from the past, because she feels abandoned. She didn't ask. She was told that she was going to be moving to a new place, and then all of a sudden she ends up in a new place. She doesn't know anyone there. And so when people show up who were part of her daily life, she gets really angry. So I had my expectations low. Uh, but we went in, and, and Lulis, who was, uh, who was in the first picture, came, came down. He's in his late 30s now, so he's no longer uh, an infant. And he was playing with us a little bit. We had, we were, he was in a, in a, there was a glass uh, a divider, so we weren't actually physically interacting. And then Tatu came down. And she stayed sort of in the far distance and didn't come close to us. But she didn't yell. And she just sat in the corner of the room and signed. Friend. And that moment when I realized that the level of empathy and the, le the depth of relationships that we have with all creatures and the inter interdependence that we have with all beings on this planet, be they plant or animal or earth, we're all one and integrated. And these messages that were shared with us at the expense of five and really thousands of chimpanzees who have had to spend their lives in, in um, captivity, hopefully are messages that will help us to understand and appreciate that these are experiments that should never have been done, that the hubris of humanity to relearn the lesson that first peoples have always known, that we're all interconnected, um, is a message that we should all carry with us. Kia ora.